So last time <coughs> I wrote this algorithm, this AKS primality test. In the input, uh, you are given a number n in binary. So first is just uh, this pre-processing, you check whether n is a perfect power or uh, whether n is even and then if it is, you output composite of course. If not, then the, uh, the algorithm, the main part of the algorithm starts. So it finds a number r such that order of n mod r is large, which is, uh, which should be at least 4 log square n plus 1 or more. And then this red check is done. For uh, several a's, you check whether x plus a to the n is x to the n plus a, modulo x to the r minus 1, comma n. If any of these tests fail, then you are sure that n is composite because it should have passed if n was prime. So, uh, if all the tests pass for a 1 to 2 square root r log n, then you give up and you say that n is prime. Now we have to show that uh, when we say prime, it is n is indeed prime, okay. There is no mistake. So for that we identify two groups. The first group is a group of numbers which is i. So we identified this subgroup i which is the numbers generated by n. So prime p divides n. So look at this now a subgroup generated by n and p mod r. So basically these are uh, product of n power p power and this group has size at least uh, 4 log square n by assumption. The second subgroup is that of field elements. We are calling it J. So this is the subgroup generated by these polynomials for which the test was done, done x plus 1 dot dot x plus l, but uh, viewed as field elements. So mod p comma h, where h is an irreducible factor of x to the r minus 1 mod p. This also is a large subgroup. So we showed that j is at least n raised to square root t in 2 square root t in fact. Okay, so now let us uh, use these two lower bounds, these two big subgroups to get uh, what we want, the correctness proof of the algorithm. So note that J is a cyclic subgroup of the field. Why is that? Well, because this uh, multiplicative subgroup of the finite field is cyclic. So every subgroup is cyclic, J, is, J in particular is also cyclic. Uh, so, the way you can use it is, since the size of i, the subgroup i is t, there exist two different pairs uh, between all smaller than square root t at most square root t such that n raised to i p raised to j is n raised to i prime p raised to j prime mod r. Right, this is true because uh, the number of n raised to i p raised to j is uh, more than square root t times square root t. 
which is more than t, but the size of the subgroup i is only t which means that two elements will be the same. So, we can find i j and i prime j prime such that they are the same mod r, but i j and i prime j prime are different pairs. Now, for these two uh, pairs what can you deduce? So, let f be a generator of j, j is a cyclic subgroup pick a generator we call it f. Then uh, you know that f of x to the n to the i p raise to j is the same as f of x to the n to the i prime p to the j prime in the finite field right simply because uh, this n to the i p raise to j and n raise to i prime p raise to j prime they are the same mod r. So, these x powers are the same. So, f evaluations are the same, but then by step 4 of the algorithm what is step 4 of the algorithm? Step 4 is this red test the red test is passing. So, if x plus a to the n is x to the n plus a then uh, since f is a product of such things you get that LHS will be equal to f raise to n raise to i p raise to j and RHS will be equal to f raise to n raise to i prime p raise to j prime mod p comma h. But f is an element of high order right. So, this means that in fact uh, size of j should divide n raise to i p raise to j minus p raise to j prime. Right. So, this is a very important step this is the key step which will finish the proof, <coughs> because uh, we are deducing from the fact that these two products are same mod r we are deducing that in fact they are the same modulo a much bigger number which is size of j. So, what does that mean? So, since uh, n raise to i p raise to j and n raise to i prime p raise to j prime both of them in value is smaller than n raise to 2 root t which is smaller than the size of j. What you deduce is that uh, they are absolutely equal not just mod absolute equal equality which means that n is a power of p. But n cannot be a perfect power that we have ruled out in pre processing step 1. So, that gives you the contradiction. Okay, so, this means that uh, if step 4 passes then n has to be prime. Okay, that finishes the proof. So, this algorithm uh, steps 1 to 4 this algorithm takes uh, remember log to the 10.5 n time 
this is the time complexity and if n is composite it outputs composite, if n is prime it outputs prime right. So, that is the full proof of a case primality test. So, you have seen uh, some very practical primality test, you have seen this uh, deterministic polynomial time primality test. Next question is once you have verified that n is composite, how do you find factors, integer factoring. Let us start with that. So, this area of integer factoring consists of only heuristics ok. The formal algorithms and formal analysis is currently missing. Uh, even at the level of heuristics these algorithms are not fast, but whatever there is we will study. So, that it gives you an idea of how possibly you can factor integers that are not too large. So, the general algorithms to factor n are slow, in fact very slow. Okay, so, currently uh, only integers in around 700 bits which in terms of uh, decimal digits is 200 digits. So, around integers of around 200 digits ok up to that could be factored. that to using specialized hardware. Okay, so, 200 digit long integers are uh, still quite large, they are like 10 raise to 200 in value. Uh, it is amazing that they can be factored in practice, but anything bigger than that it is very hard to get to an answer ok. They even for specialized hardware this is a very tough problem, it takes uh, forever to find a prime factor or any factor. Uh, theoretically the situation is uh, quite bad, so the best provable complexity that is known is uh, expected time. So, all these are randomized algorithms heuristics expected time is 2 raise to big O of log n times log log n square root. Okay, so, compare this with brute force, brute force is uh, exponential in log n and here you have square root of that in the exponent. So, it is certainly faster, but it is still not polynomial time and it is not very practical if uh, log n is large. And uh, heuristic complexity is slightly better it is one third here and two third here. Okay, 
Okay, so heuristic is a kind of one third of log in, uh, log in to the one third. Uh, provable is uh, log in to the half and this is happening in the exponent. So, this is a weird complexity function right, we have not seen this before. Uh, let us uh, talk about it a bit. We will use the notation L x alpha comma c to denote this exponential in c times log to the alpha x log to the 1 minus alpha log x and to be sure this log is natural log that is important because uh, we want to really talk about the constant multiples as well here because that may change uh, uh, the practice of it, how fast it will be in practice. So, we want c to be small and also we also want this log to the alpha x to be small, log x to the alpha to be small. So, the best algorithm known is due to an analysis by Pomeranz. It is called the general number field sieve. In short GNFS, number field sieve is NFS, generalized number field sieve is GNFS. So, using a GNFS you can factor integers in the fastest possible way currently. It has conjectured time complexity ln 1 third 2. Okay, so exponential in 2 times log x to the one, log n to the one third times log log x log log n to the two thirds. Okay. The dominating part is log to the one third that is the conjectured complexity of GNFS. Uh, so, in, the, in these two lectures, last remaining lectures, you will get uh, a good idea of uh, how this is done. Okay, you will not be able to see all the details, but you will get the basic idea. So, let us start with the, with the reason why this function appears. And the reason for this is actually quite interesting and a very important topic. It is the topic of smooth numbers. Smooth numbers are basically numbers that have small prime factors. So, number n is called y smooth if all its prime factors are less than equal to y. 
okay then we call uh, okay let me call it m so number m is called y smooth if uh, all the prime factors of m every prime factor is smaller than less than equal to y their density will be important how many numbers below x are y smooth so their density is uh, denoted by psi x comma y and this is the number of m such that m is y smooth okay so psi x comma y divided by x you can say is the density okay, so we are interested in this as a function of x and y so uh, it is actually this density that decides the complexity of integer factoring algorithms so asymptotic estimates for psi x comma y determine the complexity of advanced integer factoring algorithms so let us first see a see a proof sketch of a good estimate of psi so this was shown by dickman da bruyne it's an old result uh so it says that psi x comma y is at least x divided by u to the u where u is log of x base y which is also the same as log x by log y okay so in terms of this ratio of log x log y the number of to so the density of y smooth numbers up to x is u raised to minus u so let us see a proof sketch it will not give the full result but it will give a decent estimate and you will see why u to the u and then why this l function appears consider the regime so let's take uh, u to be at least log y okay so u is not very small and we also don't want u to be very large in the proof so we want we our proof will work when u is not very small and it is not very large so for example uh, this in particular means that y has to be large as well y cannot be too small because u less than y over log y means that y has to be more than log x 
ok. So, if y is uh, smaller than log x then the proof will not work. And uh, similarly y should not be too large because this first inequality means that log y should be less than or log y whole square should be less than log x. So, y should not be too large ok. So, under this in this regime the proof works what is the proof actually now the proof is very simple the proof idea is very simple it is that you consider uh, the primes that are less than or equal to y. So, consider all the primes that are y or less we we'll call them p 1 to p t notice that the prime numbers are uh, they are asymptotically they are like y over log y. So, they are around t many. So, let us enumerate them p 1 to p t. And now these are the, the this is kind of the base on which you will build smooth numbers m right. So, you will multiply these primes with repetition. So, any y smooth number m will look like product of p i to the alpha i. So, this means that uh, the number of numbers such numbers you will get below x. If you take alpha i is uh, appropriate alpha is then this product will be below x right. So, in particular you can use these alpha is such that the sum of alpha is less than equal to u. because u is log x by log of x to base y p i s are all smaller than y right. So, if the sum of alpha i is less than equal to u then this product of p i alpha i is smaller than x that was the reason we defined u actually like that. And this then is at least you use the binomial estimate. So, u plus t choose t then you use this simple estimate of uh, t by u to the u t is uh, in our regime t is bigger than u. So, u plus t choose t will be t by u raised to u and then you substitute for t. So, you get y raised to u divided by u times log y to the u which is what is y to the u? y to the u is x. What is u times log y? that is log x. Okay, so, that is uh, that is some decent estimate it is still not like u to the u 
because u is actually smaller than log x, but we can stop here because uh, x by log x to the u is giving us some idea of how many y smooth numbers there are below x. <coughs> but this can be made more refined and then you can get this Dickmann uh, De Bruyne's uh, estimate. So, let us uh, assume that it will work. So, then using that theorem or estimate, first thing you can observe is this bound is uh, non trivial only if u raise to u is sufficiently smaller than x. Otherwise, x over u raise to u will become 1 or less uh, that would not uh, make much sense. But if u raise to u is much smaller than x over u raise to u is a decent quantity. So, that is a good lower bound and for that to happen uh, y should not be too small. if y is too small like a constant then your u is log x and then u raise to u will be much more than x. So, y should it be too small it should not be too large right that that was our regime anyways in the proof. So, let us uh, clearly write down u as a function of x and y which will work and then you will see the L function. So, a useful tolerable y is L alpha sorry L x alpha comma c for constants alpha c. So, x is the variable if you take alpha c to be absolute constants then for this y, y equal to L x alpha comma c this De Bruyne uh, Dickman De Bruyne estimate will be good. So, in that case u raise to u comes out to be actually L x 1 minus alpha 1 minus alpha by c. So, u raise to u uh, 1 minus alpha appears there in the second exponent if you started with alpha. Okay, let us look at the calculation because this is this is an important uh, way to understand the reason why this strange function appears. So, what is log y? Log y is log of this L x alpha comma c which by definition if you look at the definition it will be what we ignore the constants and we come to the main function main function which is log x to the alpha times log 1 minus alpha log x right, this is what log y is. So, what is u? So, this will be you just want to divide by the above quantity right log x divided by that. So, you will get uh, let me make this exact because I need that this actually is just c times it is base it was exponent uh, e x p function was base e. So, this is just c times log alpha at times log 
1 minus alpha log. So, then I can write it exactly. So, this is equal to 1 over c times log of 1 minus alpha and log of alpha minus 1 log x. Right, that is what you get. What is u raise to u? Let us calculate u raise to u. So, which is uh, instead to keep calculation manageable, we will work with u times log u. So, u times log u will be the above. So, 1 by c times log of uh, this times log of alpha minus 1 log x and log of u will be. Okay, so, here I make a, uh, make some approximation. So, I forget about log of 1 by c because it is only a constant contribution log of log of log to the 1 minus alpha gives me 1 minus alpha log log x. And I get some uh, again additive lower order term log of log of log of x which I ignore. So, let us just make it approximate instead of doing the exact calculation. And uh, then you will notice so, this is coming out to be 1 minus alpha by c times one minus alpha in the exponent and then you have log of log of x to the alpha. So, which means that u raise to u will be e of this e raise to this right which is same as l x 1 minus alpha comma 1 minus alpha by c that is the full calculation. Okay, so, you get that u raise to u is again l of 1 minus alpha if u was l of alpha. So, that is a nice relationship it will keep appearing in integer factoring analysis. So, let us collect this make it a theorem. So, if you take y to be l x alpha c then the probability of choosing a y smooth m less than equal to x. This probability is psi x comma y the number of y smooth numbers divided by x and it is 1 over the previous bound that we got. So, L x 1 minus alpha. So, alpha minus 1 by c. Okay, this is the this is really the probability of y smooth numbers when y you take as an L function L of constants. So, for L of constants uh, the, the smooth such smooth numbers is actually decent it is again L of constant. So, that is the reason why L function appears. So, in integer factoring algorithms the time spent it depends on the bound y 
and the probability. Because uh, 1 over probability is expectation. So, you have to try these many numbers to get a smooth number. Okay, so, the actually the time complexity of integer factoring uses this L function. Another point is uh, time complexity of uh, this form ln alpha comma c, where alpha is of course, less than 1. This is termed in the literature of integer factoring, this is termed uh, sub exponential. Why is it termed sub exponential? sub exponential time complexity to contrast with ln 1 comma c. What is ln 1 comma c? ln 1 comma c is exponential in c times log x right which is x to the n so n to the c for any constant c no matter how small the constant c is uh, this is a very slow algorithm because n will be huge in value that is clearly exponential time and if you can reduce alpha below 1 then in in the literature it is called sub exponential So, for example, Eratosthenes sieve So, Eratosthenes sieve is just uh, you divide by all numbers from 2 to square root n to factor in right. So, the complexity will be around square root n which is a half uh, c equal to half. So, that takes ln 1 comma half time Okay, so, we are up against that ln 1 comma half is kind of the trivial algorithm to factor n that we want to reduce to ln alpha comma c where alpha is less than 1. Okay, so, so much for the L function and smooth numbers. Now, let us look at some concrete factoring algorithms. We will start with an easy one, uh, but they are still better than Eratosthenes c better than the brute force. So, let us start with some special case factoring algorithms. So, they will uh, they work better than uh, brute force. on special numbers n. They make some assumption on n, then they work better. So, first is it is called Pollard's row method. What does it do? So, suppose one of the prime factors p of n is uh, moderately small, you want to use that fact. Obviously, if you enumerate numbers from 1 to p, then 
it will take step p, but can you do better than p? That is what Pollard's row method does. So, idea is to exploit the presence of a moderately small p dividing n. So, you want to solve it in square root p time instead of trivial p. So, brute force would have been O tilde p that you want to do better than that. So, this is a clever algorithm. Uh, it will achieve square root p. How it will do it is uh, it will take a random looking function f and it will start with a value uh, with a point x and then it will apply f on x again and again application of f on x again and again. So, let us first uh, write down the algorithm. Input is odd n and uh, a pseudo random function f Actually, you can even take f to be x square plus 1 mod n. Just introduce some uh, non linearity, and then usually the function, usually these non linear functions, they behave in a pseudo random way. So, factor n in O tilde square root p times log n time that is the goal factoring in square root p time. Let us write down the algorithm. The algorithm as I said randomly picks a starting point and let us take another variable y, set it equal to x and let us set a new variable third variable d to be 1. Then what you do, there is a kind of an infinite while loop, what it does is uh, compute f of apply f on x and apply f on f y. So, on x you apply f once, on y you apply f twice. And then you compute the GCD of x minus y with n, basically checking uh, whether x is y mod n. You are taking the difference uh, or think in terms of prime p dividing n. So, you are trying to check whether x and y are the same mod p. If it is, if they are then d will become p heuristically. So, if that happens, so if d is not equal to n, then output d. So, this loop will come out only when uh, d is not 1, right. 
so d is between 1 and n if it is not 1 it may also be n but if it is not if it is neither 1 nor n then it is a prime factor then it is a factor of n. So that is a success case otherwise you will say fail. and then probably you have to repeat the experiment okay that's the algorithm so we'll make two assumptions and then analyze this so assumption is uh, p is the smallest prime factor of n and uh, second is that if you keep applying f on x then you get a random sequence okay so let's say p is the is the smallest factor of n so it's prime and uh, if you keep applying f on x then you get a random sequence with these two reasonable assumptions in fact the assumption is only the second one uh, with that assumption we will show that it takes square root p time ok so with these two assumptions what we will show is that with high probability in uh, step 2 p will divide x minus y within square root p iterations. Okay, that is what we claim. So, this while loop in step 2 will not really be infinite uh, very soon which is square root p iterations it is highly non trivial because uh, we are just applying f once and f twice again and again on x and y respectively but within square root p iterations uh, it is expected that this difference will be divisible by p and so we will come out and uh, output uh, a factor of n obviously this is a heuristic using the assumption it is a probabilistic uh, claim so so how do you show this well since you are assuming that this f applied i times on x is a random sequence so the probability of uh, f 0 i x viewed mod p uh, for let us say i 0 to j minus 1. So, these being distinct there is an upper bound on this probability right because the numbers uh, the residues you can get is 0 1 2 dot dot p minus 1. So, in the first case uh, for i equal to 0 this can be any value. So, that probability is basically 1 so I write it as p over p possibilities uh, in the second case since you do not want to overlap with the first one this is p minus 1 by p and uh, in the end you get you get p minus j plus 1 by p which I write as um, you go up to ok you maybe you go up to j hmm. So, at i equal to j you have uh, this p minus g excluded uh, g excluded. So, it is p minus j by p. 
So, you see this as 1 minus 1 over p dot dot 1 minus j over p. So, this is e raise to minus 1 over p minus 2 over p dot dot minus j over p, which is around e raise to minus j square by p. That is the probability estimate. So, if you take j to be less than square root p uh, by 2 or square root p by 10, then you see that this probability is sufficiently small. So, these elements in the sequence random sequence being different mod p is actually low probability. So, with high probability there is an overlap and overlap means that the difference will be divisible by p. So, this implies that for g smaller than square root p the probability for a suitable fixing of j let us say square root p by 10, the probability of a repetition obviously mod p is good. This calculation should remind you of something called the Birde paradox. that is what is going on here. So, if you collect square root p random things then numbers then two of them will be the same mod p that is what it is saying. So, this means that there exists i 1 i 2 at most uh, square root p such that f applied i 1 times is the same as f applied i 2 times mod p. So, this seems so what, what how does this relate to step 2 of the algorithm right. There we were just applying x uh, we were applying f once and y we are applying it twice. So, how does this relate to what we have deduced in terms of i 1 i 2. So, we are almost there we just have to connect it properly. So, after the what is happening is that you started with something and then in the sequence, the sequence f i f composed i times x mod p that starts with some value and then it starts repeating. Okay, so, this is the 0th iteration, this is the i 1th iteration and then let us say this period is r. So, let us so, so, this will be the i 1 plus t th iteration and this will be i 1 plus r minus 1th iteration and in the next iteration which is i 1 plus r the thing repeats. Okay, so, this is how it is moving forward. Okay, so, this is also the reason why it is called the row method because you can look at this picture how the iterations are going. 
which is uh, how the sequence f i x mod p is changing. So it may start at some value, but after few iterations, that particular value, after I at the i one iteration, that particular value will repeat with period r. So let R defined to be I2 minus I1 be the period. That is what we have learnt. This happens with high probability, this row picture. So, uh, in step 2, what happens? So, I 1 plus T th iteration of step 2 gives us I 1 plus T th times composed x with f and twice that on x. Right? These are the two values you are getting because x you are going one step at a time, y you are going uh, two steps. So, in i 1 plus t th iteration you are getting i 1 plus t and two times i 1 plus t. So, a collision occurs that is the key thing. So, collision mod p happens if these two values overlap mod r the period that is the period of the circle in rho which means that the first time you will see the collision right that will be when t is equal to r minus i 1 this is the first collision. So, I 1 plus t you take it to be r and at that thing will at that iteration you will see the collision and uh, hence we are done. So, this means that p will divide x minus y at uh, r which is at most square root p iteration of step 2. Okay, so, this finishes uh, the proof of this lemma statement in blue with high probability p will divide x minus y in step 2 in only square root p iterations. So, the time complexity of this is, so with high probability p divides d in step 2 in O tilde square root p iterations and in each iteration you are doing everything in around log n time. So, that is the algorithm, Pollard's row algorithm. Okay.